Yep. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, start this next session. Uh, we are running about 10 minutes late, um, and, but we will finish this at just after 10 past 12. About, we'll do about half an hour. Now, it's my great pleasure to be joined by David Willits on the... the must be the, This is the topic du jour, isn't it, really? How is the Conservative Party going to run the economy, assuming that they stay in power, because that's what they seem to be able to do? Uh, I, <laughs> I've, I've known David for a very long time. I think I first met you in the early 1990s when I was a cub researcher at the IFS, and you were at the Centre of Policy Studies, which at the time was seen as the Thatcherite vanguard of the Conservative Party on the right wing. And now I think you might be described as to the left of Rishi Sunak, who's described by some <laughs> people on the right wing as a socialist these days. So I don't know whether that's... You, you're, you've had a... Uh, an intellectual journey, all the parties had an intellectual journey, but really, David, what's going on? Um, <laughs> look, so far this morning, the questions have all been easy and you've been doing the straightforward <laughs> topics. Now we're getting into the really tricky stuff. Um, what is going on? Well, and look, by the way, my, um, I think possibly there's both the party and I have changed, but we've been moving in opposite directions. Um, what is going on? Well, the, if I was trying to think of a sort of good angle on this absolute preoccupation with tax cuts, which does look, from an external perspective, very odd and like a kind of displacement activity. Tax cuts is how the Conservative Party is talking about living standards. It's, what it's saying there is a problem. So it is not in a state of denial. You may think that the instrument the party wishes to use to tackle it is ill-targeted or inadequate, but it is a recognition that living standards have been flat for 15 years, and there's a group of people, particularly at the, the lower end of the income scale, who've got a very serious problem. So I think, that, so it, it, I think it's a step towards an engagement with a wider debate about living standards, and I would see it in that light. That's the best I can do. <laughs> but I think there is something in that angle. And, and I think and now would, there'll be a debate in the Tory about exactly what one does do. And that would apply to both personal tax cuts and corporate tax cuts? Or, or do you see the corporate side as actually trying to address the longer-term growth uh, worries that we've been discussing this morning? Yeah, I mean, if you look at... And again, one of the themes in our report is, uh, is investment, particularly one has to say business investment, because actually the story on public investment is quite good. That is now going up. The story on business investment is catastrophic. That went down post-COVID and has stayed low. So again, you may think that the instrument is inadequate for the purpose, but either through overall reductions in corporation tax rates or measures like Rish's particular targeted allowances, again, my friends in the Conservative Party think this is engaging with the problem of low levels of business investment. So my view is actually all this is evidence that the agenda... <coughs> the issues that people are concerned about are not so different from the ones that we've been talking about in this room. And do you think when we get a new leader of the party, a new prime minister, and they go into the treasury and Claire Lombardelli tells them that the public finances don't look quite so good, uh, that maybe a 50 billion, 2% of GDP immediate tax cut isn't, doesn't necessarily protect our medium term public finances and at a time of high inflation, and full employment, it might not be the most good thing to do on a cyclical basis either. What's going to happen then? What we, do you think, do you, is it all just about the selectorate of the MPs now and then the Conservative Party members, and when we, when we get it, it, it will sort of go back to normal, or are we seeing a big shift in the party? Well, there is, of course, the ritual when a completely newly elected government arrives, so having won an election and having made wild promises, when in the first week the Chancellor announces with great shock that he's inspected the books and has been very shocked to discover that they're in a far worse position than he expected. And sadly, because of the mess left by his predecessors, he's not quite going to be able to do everything that he promised because he hadn't realized how bad things were. And doing that when it's the same party is tougher. It's trickier. Um, I would be very surprised if there are 
uh, very substantial tax cuts in the near future. But remember, I think the conversation with Claire Lombardelli might go slightly differently. It might go, hang on, you showed in your own previous budget forecast an incredibly rapid uh, improvement in the public finances. The pace at which the deficit disappears is extremely fast. And you do seem to, ha and there does seem to be some fiscal headroom set aside for two years out. Um, why can't we spend that money now? To which Treasury officials will say, hang on, that is our contingency reserve. That is for when things really get bad, and that's for things that we can't necessarily anticipate. We need to keep that headroom, to which the Chancellor will say, hang on, things are really bad now. We have a cost of living crisis now. What could be worse, and what could justify not spending using that headroom now? So I, I think there will be... So I can see some of that fiscal headroom being used, but not, nothing like 50 billion. And do you see, um, we've talked quite a bit about institutions this morning, about uh, particularly economic institutions, and the Bank of England is now going to go through, it has to go through the first time since independence, uh, the time when it has to be the bad guy. Mm. It hasn't quite got there yet. Uh, in, certainly in the May report, it, it got there in its forecast. It said, we need a recession to get inflation down. In its language, it didn't get there, but it is getting there pretty quickly at the moment. And I think it's going to be there in the next few weeks. How difficult does that make it for a new government who wants to, for totally legitimate reasons, uh, help out vulnerable households and maybe all households in the cost of living squeeze but the cost of living squeeze is coming at a time when we've got pretty full employment. Uh, growth has been pretty strong this morning, uh, unexpectedly strong, and there is a need uh, to get inflation down. It's, it's going to be a very difficult autumn, isn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. But, and of course, I think it'll be another test for the model. I mean, one of the most um, telling criticisms of the independent role of the Bank of England was would it be possible properly to coordinate monetary policy and fiscal policy? Um, and people who've been close to this over the past few years would say that actually through a variety of arrangements including advanced briefing on budget proposals and things like that we've ended up with a reasonable amount of coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. The autumn is going to be a challenge on that and one of the other messages that you might well imagine a new chancellor receiving is, OK, if you want to blow all this money on tax cuts now, you may well find interest rates are right, going to rise faster than you would otherwise would have wished. So I think there will be a bit of jostling yeah. between the fiscal policy lever and the monetary policy lever. And an incoming chancellor might be tempted, if he were then having to lower expectations and doesn't deliver as big a tax cut as might, he might have wished, one of his arguments might be, otherwise I would have seen interest rates rising more, which itself would have had a big impact on the household finance. To talk about the longer term, if we look at, look at the, the next decade as we have been this morning, the, the Johnson government, Johnson as uh, Prime Minister, uh, high investment, high public investment, uh, environment net zero central to that, uh, levelling up uh, were the key planks of the sort of longer term economic policy. Uh, clearly it depends, if, if Rishi wins, I don't see that necessarily changing so much, but with other candidates it might. How, how do you see both what you think is, will happen to the party, but also how it differs between the different wings of the party? Yeah, I mean the list in the uh, May's lecture uh, you know, innovation, skills, and investment as the three priorities is not a bad list. And I don't know, I, you know, I, I, don't, I really don't know how it's all going to play out, but, um, but I think Liz Truss and many other candidates wouldn't have that dissimilar a list. And I think political realities, dem democratic politics will drive the Conservative Party to engage with the, the kind of issues we've been talking about today. And I, I'd offer two reasons. I mean, first of all, um, without, without sounding too cynical about it, one of the ways in which the Conservative coalition is assembled is by people in the middle identifying with the interests and views of people who are affluent, a shared interest in 
holding down taxes, a shared belief in property ownership, you're on a route to own your own home, or you already own it. Um, and if instead the people in the middle look as if their experience of the world is closer to that of the classic, sad, uh, sadly uh, disadvantaged precariat at the bottom, and it looks as if the middle ground voter, the median income, middle of the range voter, no longer thinks he or she is going to end up as a homeowner unless they've already got it, no longer believes that their wages are going to rise, are themselves really feeling the pressure from um, uh, increases in the cost of living. Suddenly, you, the, the Conservative coalition doesn't look very robust. Those figures earlier for um, comparing incomes and increases in incomes at different points of the income range in the UK tell you that it's going to be harder to hold the Conservative coalition together. So you want to do, you want to do things for middle income voters. And then in turn, the next point about the politics is some of those centre ground middle income voters in marginal seats, the Watfords of this country, themselves care about how the lowest income people are treated. And one of the endless arguments in the Conservative Party, and again, I think in, uh, these are the kind of way people think of these, even if you don't believe that the lowest income voters in tough inner city areas are going to vote Tory, there may be middle income wavering Lib Dem voters in more prosperous parts of the country for whom whether or not they vote Tory is affected by how you treat and what policies you have to operate people at the bottom of the heap. So from my experience of these type of conversations in conservative circles, that's, that's how you get attention to these types of issues. And how about the, I mean, because one of the, being a home-owning democracy is so central mm. to the Conservative Party. Um, it's obviously, as w with house prices having gone up so much, mm. particularly in London and the South East, so that it's very difficult unless you have inherited wealth to get into the property market. And we're seeing huge changes uh, across the generations in, in terms of home, home ownership. Does that begin to split apart? I mean, is, is the intergenerational uh, question, does that split apart the Conservative coalition or the fact that most of the Conservatives own property and think, well, actually, we can, as long as we don't have high inheritance taxes and keep property taxes, though, we can give it to our kids. Yeah. Which, well, which wins out. I it? know, I know. And you'll be on the, the number of, of Conservative discussions of this, which boil down to the debate whether this is a generational effect or a life cycle effect. And eventually, people will end up owning their homes. I mean, I think you've put your finger on it, and it's something we're both very interested in. Um, I think the most... The most, you could argue the most important chart in the, in the report today that for this is the extraordinary rise in assets from three times income to eight times income over the last 30 or 40 years. And going back to the discussion we had in the panel uh, earlier on inequality, I mean, one very simplified way of thinking about this is Imagine there is no change in the distribution of income. And of course, although there was a rise in inequality in the 1980s, not much since. And imagine there's no change in the distribution of wealth, though by and large wealth is less unequally distributed than income. The Gini coefficient for wealth is about inequality is about twice for income. So that you don't imagine you don't have any changes showing up in the conventional metrics. But then the value of assets rises from three times income to eight times income. That makes a society feel much more unequal because the, un the more unequal thing has become much more significant. And it means that using your uh, acquiring an asset out of earnings, and of course housing is the most important one, acquiring an asset out of earnings has become a lot harder. It means that inheritance matters a lot more. And we shouldn't forget the other big assets as big as housing is pensions. And although there is, you say, a scenario when people can um, look forward to inheriting their house, so the average age of inheritance now is 61, so it's quite a long wait. Um, on pensions, the boomers' defined benefit pension schemes are not heritable assets. And there is no, although there is a modest attempt to bring in some inheritance for some DC pensions, the other main form of wealth is not heritable, 
And what are the prospects even for middle income, middle class earners now building up a company pension, anything like as valuable as a classic DB pension? That form of asset uh, wealth is not going to be enjoyed in any kind of life cycle effect because it's being extinguished on death. So I think the challenge of how you spread a property-owning democracy in the kind of environment we describe in the interim report is, is a real one. And again, there are concerns. And to be fair to him, and it's a, and it's a pity he can't be with us. To be fair to him, Michael Gove is one of the people who completely gets this and is very engaged with, with what you can do to spread home ownership. And I personally think that on, on pensions, and I, I don't know if his Adair is still with us, but the... You know, the auto-enroll pension model, the, ba the bad news is there's not much money in those auto-enroll pension pots. The good news is the framework has reached out to millions of people, so it is more widely accessible than many of us dared hope. Just imagine a bold set of conservative policies that say we're going to use the framework of the auto-enroll pension to really boost the pension savings of large numbers of middle earners. And these are the radical things we're doing on everything from planning permission through to uh, mortgage regulation to get more people owning their own homes. So, it, as, so as, as, as we've been discussing throughout the conference this morning, this is not impossible. These are things that could be done if there were organized intelligence systematically applied to the problem. Do you think the party at the moment, this is the last question from me, so I'm just going to open it up to the floor in a second. Do you think the party is, um, particularly after the Cheshire and Amersham by-election, we just mentioned planning, something that can be done, uh, but hasn't been done. Uh, is, is, are we any closer to a world when the Conservative Party starts thinking, we, were, we, we appeared to be at the start of this parliament, but we've moved in what I would say is the wrong direction. Uh, since, and that was partly a voter effect. Yeah, and, and I would say that the, going back to again another strand earlier, what's politically possible? In the old days, an 80 seat majority looked like a government that could do inc incredibly bold and difficult things. And what we have found is an 80, 80 seat majority nowadays is not what it used to be. It was a, uh, it, it lo looks as if the uh, party discipline, I think this applies across all parties, and it's partly to do with social media and building up the identities of individual MPs. It looks like party discipline is weaker, uh, rebellions are stronger, and I, I think for, on radical planning reform, that makes things harder. And the other angle, incidentally, we had the trade discussion in our previous session. A lot of Tory muttering that one of the angles that the Lib Dems you are using in the seats they win, especially most recently in Devon, is the Australian trade agreement and agriculture. And tr trade deals, part of the American fast track trade negotiation process, or indeed handing trade over to the EU, means that you don't have directly to confront voters about the specific decisions you've taken in trade deals. I think there's a view in Tory circles that they're not going to get another trade deal like Australia's and with a pretty open move to ag agriculture markets through the Conservative Party either, because that's what the Lib Dems will go for. So it does look harder and harder to get things done. That is the frustration. Great. Right. Questions? I'm sure there's loads of questions for David. Yes, just over there if you can say your name. Uh, and I think, we can, I think we'll allow some comments as well, because we, we are, in a, we are in, a, in a very, very uncertain uh, and interesting world. So I'll hear people's comments as well. Yeah, Liam Sides. I don't know what's going on with that. I I'll just talk, you know, instead of put that away from me. Uh, Liam Sides, I'm just interested. What, what does the Tory what party offer do younger people today? Oh. Good question. I'll just repeat that for people online. What does the Tory party offer yeah. younger people, David? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the analysis um, which we've done earlier at Resolution does show indeed that the, you've now got um, an age divide in voting, uh, replacing the class divide. So I think we need to offer far more to younger people. I think that the, as I said, the, probably the most important one is a credible route to a property owning democracy with credible routes to a pension that's worth something and being able to buy your own home. I just think those are the, 
the highest priorities. I think there's then a wider issue in the culture wars, which is the extent to which in the culture wars you find either deliberately or inadvertently you are challenging the attitudes of younger voters. So um, I think uh, as a minimum, some kind of peace deal in the culture wars is probably something you need if you want to win back younger voters. But if they're owners and if you're not fighting their cultural values, um, I, I think, again, you can see a scenario through. When I was working for Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, she was uh, saving, her biggest public expenditure saving was linking pen, the state pension to, to prices alone, and she was getting over 40% of the votes of younger people. I mean, that's really, I mean, what, what we see in, the, uh, in voting patterns now is it's very age-skewed voting. And so the key question, I think, there is, do you see, do you see this as an age or a cohort effect? Do you, is it just that when people get into middle age, they get a bit more comfortable, or at least the middle, middle class, upper middle class people get more comfortable and think, now I'm going to be a vote conservative because I want to protect that? Or is, are we seeing generational differences? Yes, and, uh, and I mean, that is... It is not an absurd political strategy to appeal systematically to the over 50s, provided you don't find 10 years later you're appealing to the over 60s, in which case you've got a problem. Uh, so, and to the balance between it being life cycle effect, I mean, there is some evidence that when people throughout their adult lives are asked about the most important political events that have shaped their attitudes, they tend to refer to events that happened when they're in their late teens and 20s. Uh, and there's also some evidence that if you voted for the same party twice, you're then quite likely to stick with it. So there, that would suggest that there are uh, cohort issues. Um, but interestingly, in 2019, the Conservative Party did rather better with amongst younger voters than 2017. The most vivid example of the age-segregated election actually was 2017, not 2019. So, um, I think it is, it is not unreasonable for the Conservative... If the Conservative Party really wanted to, one can see the outline of what a political strategy would be that would appeal to people as they entered middle age and older. I was just trying to put a, a question from online up, but I think I've managed to fail to do it, but I'll, I'll read it out instead, uh, which is how does, um, how does a small state... Uh, conservative party address the issues are they? how will a low tax small state uh, address the questions issues that were raised this morning is that actually possible well um, it's <laughs> the answer is pub, public expenditure and tax is very likely to be on an upward trend because of pressures driven by demographics on health and pension spend uh, so it's very hard to see how you can avoid those type, kind of upward pressures, especially as ironically, the, those are main, those are programs which Tory voters themselves are very keen on. So yes, it's very it, it's hard to see how you get off some kind of slow upward trend. On on kind of small state, as soon as you start saying nimble state, effective state, um, are the things that it's doing badly and shouldn't be bothering to do and other things it should focus on. And we have limited capacity to do stuff. So if we're really going to put all our resources and effort into something like the transition to net zero, there's lots of other things we won't be able to do. As soon as you start explaining that, which I'm sure is the experience of any person here who's worked in government in, in Whitehall in whatever way, there is limited bandwidth, there is limited capacity. Someone who said, I'm going to use the state to solve a very long list of problems would be much less credible than someone who said, I've got some strategic discipline, and I'm going to focus on these which are our highest priorities. So again, I can, I can see, there is a, I sometimes think part of the, the secret of British conservatism, it's kind of like a Mary Poppins bag. If you open it up, you find all these things, almost any circumstances, at some point, a democratic party on the centre-right has wrestled with them and has found a way through. Now, and the question is whether it's got the capacity to do that renewal at the moment, and uh, I think it's, n and the, the tax cut debate is not going to get very far. It's if it's transmuted into something more constructive, and if small becomes nimble, then we can make some progress. Any other questions? Then? Yep. In the second, in the in third row here. Uh, Willie Clarkson Smith. Uh, Dave, you touched upon 
trade, and I wondered whether you actually believe that the Conservative Party is any longer a party of free trade or not. Well, I mean, obviously, we've just left a very large trade block. I'm a shameless remainder. I think it's a, it, that's a, a terrible blow to the British economy. Um, on, on trade, the, that's, why it's so I, that's why this agriculture point is quite tricky. I do think there's a genuine desire to go out and do what would be, on any conventional measure, free trading agreements with the US. India, which we haven't talked about, but is clearly in current government thinking, who knows, how it might change, but if it's Rishi, it may well not change, is a significant priority kind of target markets, um, target strategic partner for lots of reasons, including trade opportunities. So yeah, I think there will be a genuine attempt to negotiate significant free trade deals. The trouble is they're bloody hard to do and we've, and we're leaving, and we've left the single market and the customs union. Um, whether... Uh, uh, and, but I think the protectionist strand in conservatism, which was very significant at various moments in our history, I don't, I don't see that coming back. I think the Conservative Party remains fundamentally a believer in trade agreements, even though Brexit has been a disaster. And are you, even though, as you were saying, that some of the agricultural elements of trade agreements are now going mm. down badly in, uh, mm. in the rural areas? Yes, I think that's another... I remember talking to one uh, minister um, at some st stage of Brexit. We were gossiping about this trade issue, and he said to me, I don't think we'll ever get a trade agreement through Parliament. He could not see how, given the politics of these things. It's no accident, as I said earlier, that you try to hand the power over to some alternative body. He, I can't see a way we can get this through Parliament. In reality, we've ended up with a minimal level of parliamentary scrutiny of trade agreements, partly to try make it possible to uh, negotiate them. There will be some nervous uh, MPs from agricultural areas uh, worried about the, the, uh, the Lib Dem vote. But I think, an, I suspect an Indian progress on negotiating a deal with India will be a very high priority. Other questions? Yep. Paul. Thank you very much, Paul Swinney, Centre for Cities. Uh, has levelling up died with Boris Johnson's oh. premiership? Um, I don't know. I, it will partly depend on Michael's Gove's role, if any, in a future government. Greg Clark, and it's great to see Greg back, Greg is definitely committed on all this. So it will partly depend on personnel. If you imagined a Michael-Greg um, alliance in a Conservative cabinet in the autumn, I would be optimistic, but that, may, uh, neither, that it might not happen for either of them. Um, there is, again, the reality of uh, the red wall seats, and plus, as I said, this picture that, again, people in prosperous parts of the southeast like the idea that you're trying to do things for other parts of the country. And there is, I have to say, an underestimated NIMBY element to all this, which is a lot of those Tories in Surrey who don't like more housing in Surrey like the idea you're doing things to promote housing in other parts of the country. So again, you can, you can, um, you can see a way through, but it's... It is, it is tricky, because I, uh, and it, a lot will depend on personnel. Final question, I think. Time for one more. Yep. No, it's, it's helpful for the mic for people online. OK, no problem. Um, so same question, really, but for net zero. So how secure is net zero? Um, and do you, in particular, think there are risks that the net zero agenda gets wrapped up with the culture wars? and that we kind of lose a foc the focus that's required? Um, and will, does that present risks to the speed of the tra necessary transition? Thank you. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that climate change denial is a uh, powerful, significant force amongst the candidates and likely composition of the next Tory cabinet. Um, what I do worry about, and look, I should, um, 
I was in the cabinet when those big reductions in the home insulation spend happened. And looking back, I can see that that was one of our worst mistakes. And one of my regrets is that even with 30 billion of spending going in, and I reported this earlier, there isn't a revival of that. So I think the worst case scenario is in an attempt to find further public expenditure savings, um, including you know, raiding funding from a range of sources to focus entirely on the media income and consumption effect, that uh, green initiatives are not protected and lose out further. That's the worst case scenario. Not with a rationale of climate change denial, but just saying we've got to deal with the here and now. Um, the more optimistic one is indeed that uh, you ramp up rapidly a home insulation program. You target that group of, I um, have to say, particularly workless younger men. It's a better narrative for declining, much more significant decline amongst worklessness of young women. Make that into a job opportunity, make it nationwide, package it as part of a leveling up agenda. We're going to be turning up in the streets of Bolton with new young men trained to install your. Um, in do, in put in the insulation and install your um, new heating system. Um, if we're lucky, they'll do that, but they've missed, they missed the opportunity this spring, and it would be a great pity if we miss it again in, the, in an autumn statement. Right, well, I think that's, that's time uh, up for this session. I'd just like to thank David hugely uh, for stepping in and talking about the Conservative Party uh, that he knows better than us at a time when we really don't know. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know much. <laughs> what, what's going on or what's going to happen. Maybe in a, in, in a few weeks we'll know some more. But give David a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>